Okay. Another short class today. The new contest will only be half of the presentation. But I'll go really slow, really, really slow, like I did last time. Um, we're going to start with review. As always, really important to make sure we understand everything, understand everything that we talked about in the previous few weeks. Um, so we'll start with that. Operator overloading. We talked about how operator overloading is a special function with a fixed name, right? We always start with operator with whatever the operator is, with no space, okay? So this whole thing together is one name, don't split them out. And then you put in your parameter, now there's, okay, we're going to talk about that next slide, but this is just an example of an operator overloading with parameter that has a return type and that could be constant. All the other properties are the same as any other functions. We talked about how operator uh, has to be specified for every single operator in every single way you're going to use it, right? Um, we showed you different operators that are related, right? Greater than versus greater than equal to. We showed you the same operator that are used differently, pre and post increment. Um, yeah, so those all have to be separately overloaded in your class. Two ways of overloading. Member function of a class, non-member function, which is a regular function that does not belong to any of the class. Four exceptions that cannot be overloaded, right? Member operator, pointer to member operator, scope operator, and our conditional operator. All right, let's look at how it overloads. We focus on binary first, and later on we spend some time on unary. For binary, uh, you can have two ways for the first condition. Right? The first case is when the, lock, when the left operand of your operator is an object of the class. In that case, you could use either one. Right? You can either do member function overloading with the right-hand side operand as the parameter, or you can have a regular function overloading that takes in two parameters, uh, both the left-hand side operand and the right-hand side operand. But when your left operand is not an object of your class, that is when you can only use non-member function overloading that takes in both the left-hand side and the right-hand side as parameters, right? With that, let's look at unit operator. Uh, unit operator, you can pick either one. You could do member function overloading or non-member function overloading. Uh, because there's only one operand for uh, unary, for member function overloading, there will be no parameter because whatever object you're calling that function from is your operand. For regular function overloading, that's non-member function, you do take in that operand as the single parameter you have in that overloading function. Right? So examples. We first talk about greater than. If we look at the greater than operator, when you're comparing two things, both of them should be an object of your class. Right? They should be an object, uh, two objects of the same class. Therefore, you could pick. On the left-hand side is an example of member function overloading where your function will be, will be defined inside your class. So this overloading function belongs to class student. When you're overloading a function, everything you consider for a function you need to consider here as well, whether you want to pass in constant, whether you want to pass in constant reference, whether you want to pass in by value, consider that for all of your parameters. At the same time, do you want that function to be constant? When I say function here, it's really the use of the operator, right? We are overloading the operator greater than over here. For it to be constant, meaning that we will be allowing uh, the comparison between two constant students. If you don't have that there, that will not be possible, right? The return type Boolean, um, so you need to make sure you check every single uh, part of this function. The other way of viewing it 
will be the non-member function overloading. So this is a regular function. You can say it's not from student, it's not from any class, it's just a function that you would implement inside main C++, for example. For that, you would then take in both the left-hand side operator and operand and the right-hand side operand. Say that you're comparing S0 and S1, both are students. Whenever you are passing in a class object, please do not copy by value. Can you do that? Probably. Do people do that? Not at all. Right? This is the most easy way to optimize your code is that you don't know how big is that, therefore pass it by reference. You want it to be safe? Constant. So whenever you pass an object that belongs to a class like this, your first option should always be constant reference. If you really need to change that parameter, then remove the constant. You will still pass it by reference, just don't pass it as constant. We almost never pass it by value for an object. Okay? So consider that for both of your parameters and return type. One important thing for non-member function overloading is that you most likely will be interacting with class member. And it's very common to want to interact with private member. For your operator overloading function to be able to access anything down here in the private session of your class student, you need them to be friend. So you need to have student friend the specific operator overloading function that you have. Let's look at the input and output, right? The example where we used to demonstrate when your left hand side operand is no longer your class. What do you do? For that, you have one and only one option for overloading is non-member function overloading that takes in both operands as parameters. For insertion operator, right? you still consider what you do for your parameter. If you're going to change output, pass in by reference. If you're not going to change student, pass in constant reference. Another thing you need to be very careful is whether you return by reference. This is what allows your operator to have cascaded function call. Okay? For insertion and extraction operator, C in and C out, right? printing and entering, you do need to allow that. Therefore, you want to return by reference so that when you have that in, you can then do cascade it. So right now here, this is the same thing. Okay. For non-member function loading, this is the demo uh, example of friending right, from the object class to your function, your operator overloading function. And when you use that, all you need to do is that single operator should run everything you have in this function. Right? Finally, we talked about unit operator. Uh, unit operator, you always have two choices. You can either do the one on the left where it's a function, member function of the student class, or you could do the one on the right where your function is just a regular function which does not belong to any of the class. But for that, to be able to access anything in the private, you do need to find them, right? Same as the binary operator um, when both left-hand side and right-hand side are the class, are an object, are objects of the class. All right, finally, our special operator Increment. Increment looks exactly the same, but depends on where you put it. At the beginning or at the end, it runs differently. So we have pre-increment and post-increment. For pre-increment and post-increment, you the way that C++ distinguish your function overloading is by a dummy parameter integer. The reason is dummy because you do not use that. If we look at pre and post increment, 
Operator, another thing you have noticed probably here is return by reference. Because for pre-increment, you do need to allow cascaded function call, but you do not need to do that for post. Let's look at implementation. We spent a lot of time on this uh, with the memory draw out, right? Where the pre-increment, you increase whatever you want to increase, and then you return star this by reference to allow cascaded function call. This is the same pattern as any cascaded function call, right? Whenever you want something to be able to cascade, you return star this by reference. For post increment, it's a little special because you need to save a copy first. The purpose of post increment is that even uh, right after we incremented something, we can still access the older version before it was it's incremented. Therefore, you need to save a copy first. So you just create a local variable. That's the same type of the object. So for the here, I have student. And when I have the student, just name a temp or whatever you want. That's going to be destroyed the minute you, ask, you exit this, right? So that will point to the object, right? This is the way you access object. And then you do your increment and you return temp. Because you don't need to worry about cascaded function call, you return temp as it is. You do not want to return by reference. Does anyone know why we do not want to return by reference? Because hmm? we don't want to change it and send it, like return it. We, I mean, it's temp. So temp is a copy, and we won't be changing it, right? So if we return a reference to temp, we will be returning the right thing. It's just we will not create a copy. Remember the return by value, we return by reference difference, right? When we return by value, what's happening is we're going to create a copy of this and then return that. When you return by reference, you just return that. Why for this case, I'm not saying that it's not necessary. I'm saying that you do not want to do it. It's going to break your code. Why? While you all are thinking, oh, working work. for student student function name right and then the name is temp remember that this is the name that's the name and we have an address remember that box that we normally draw out there's, here's the value, whatever the value is. The value will be an object, right? Object, for example. That's the scope. That's the name. That's the value. Name is temp. Temp belongs to this function, right? Meaning, at this point, it got created. At this point, we return it. When we return by value, like what we have here, right? What's going to happen? We will create a copy of this whole object, right? It will have whatever the name. Do I have a name here? Nope, I don't. Okay. So that I have a main. What's our main? Median. Uh, median plus plus, for example. Okay, so M equal to median, is it pre-increment or post-increment, post-increment, so plus plus. Say that's our main. Okay. So what happened when I call this is that, uh, specifically over here, I will create a copy over here. We're going to have scope main, what's the name? And 
object. We create it, we change the scope, we change the name, the same object, right? Because we create a copy when you return by body, okay? Now what happened after I return? Exactly, gone. So it works, right? It's perfect, we return that, it's gonna become something in main and we continue our code. What if we return by reference? What does that mean? We are creating a reference
going to find all the other four lines or four classes or whatever you have in the hundreds of files to modify them at the same time. That caused trouble for other software engineer, for yourself even. You always forget that. You're like, oh, okay, I have four. I finished them. And then a couple breaks, you're like, oh, darn it, I have a five. You go in. Uh, when, you're, when your code break, without knowing, it's actually sometimes a big deal, especially when you have things in your mind. So this hugely reduce the chance of you change something, you forgot to change other things, right? Because you have only one center of truth. If you want to change or update or upgrade something, if you do it, you know that all the other classes will take the updated version. Then you don't need to be like, oh, right, there's four other classes that use this. I need to go and modify them all. That's why dry code is so important, right? That's why we do not want to write anything that's redundant, duplicated, or repeated. To support this concept of inheritance, I'm going to give you a couple new terms. Base class, very easy to understand, right? The basic that you're absorbing from. Derived class is the new class that you're trying, you're writing, where you will take the base class, you modify it, you customize it, that will be your derived class. Mm -hmm. Some restriction on when you can do this. One example I already gave was, oh, this is not big enough. Okay, I will not zoom in. One example I already gave was I, the student, grad student, undergrad student, of course, right? The student class will be my base class where I derive my grad student and undergrad student from. Similarly, if you have a class shape, yeah, I have a circle, triangle, rectangle, cube, they can all derive from the same class shape. Account, admin account, user account can both derive from the same base class account. Why do I give those examples? Because they all have what we call the East A relationship. Grad student is a student. Undergrad student is also a student. Triangle is a shape. Cube is a shape. User account is an account. Admin account is an account. Right? Just because there is this SA relationship, therefore I don't have to write from scratch from a grad student, undergrad student, admin, and admin account, and user account. I can have a base class. All right, here's our one pager, I mean, two pager, um, summary of the properties and rules of inheritance. So now I have two class. Class Y inherit from class X, okay? So now I have the following properties. One, class Y automatically own all the member of a class, of the base class. Member functions, member variables are the same, you immediately have a copy. There are some exceptions. Constructor, destructor, and assignment operator overloading cannot be automatically inherited. Here well, are some assignment operators. So we talk about equal, definitely assignment, right? We talked about plus equal. Last time we did operator overloading, assignment. There's also subtraction assignment, multiplication assignment, division assignment, anything that you can think of that follow this pattern you can kind of do, right? So there's a lot of assignment operator. If you see anything in that list that's overloaded uh, from the base class, inside the base class, you cannot, it will, it will not be automatically inherited. Can you write a new one? Yes, we'll talk about that. All right, so now that's the first part. Now this first part is basically the first bullet point. I'm showing you the rest because I don't have enough space to put into the previous screenshot that I have. The first one we talked about, right? Why automatically owns all the members or variable and function does not include constructive destruction and assignment. Okay, yeah, you're good with that. Second, class Y has access to class X constructor and destructor. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between the two, right? The first one, you own it. You only mean that you have a copy of them. Right? Well, however you see that you have test one, test two, test three, why immediately has test one, test two, test three? Right? But class X constructor will not be inherited over, but class Y can call it. This is 
is when I say has access to. Do you own exactly the same constructor as class X? You do not. Can I trigger it? Yes, you can. You have access to class X constructor. Will you be able to call that explicitly or implicitly? We're going to show you both ways. There are different types of inheritance we're going to talk about at the very end, so don't worry about it right now because we'll only be doing public inheritance for this class. Public inheritance will allow class Y has access to public and protected variables. This is where we have not talked about protected and how to use it, but I have told you that there's public, private, and protected. This is where protected is, uh, is useful because for inheritance, you not only have access to public, you also have access to protected. All right, so those are all about inheriting directly from class X. Let's look at what I can do on top. For class Y, you can add new members that include member variables and member functions. You can add new stuff. You can also replace something that you inherited. You can replace existing member inherited from class X with new upper, uh, implementation by what we call overriding. Okay? And we will show example four often, but this is one page to some this. All right, let's look at constructor and function overloading. Here's my setup for my base class. I have class student. I have class student, right? The same class that you need. Should be very familiar by now. Been using student for many examples. Takes in a constructor, right? Name test one, test two, test three to initialize it. Two functions: one getter to get average, one to calculate grade. Private members: name test one, test two, test three, and the calculation of average down here is also a private function. So that's my setup of student. Now, I want a new class, grad student. Inside my grad student class, I want to have all the test scores that, uh, I want to have same numbers of test scores as students, so I will have test one, test two, test three. But I also want to add another research credit on top. I want to have the same set of functions, meaning that my grad students should be able to get their average, should be able to get their grade as well. We want to calculate grade based on test score and the research credit for grad student, right? So this average, as you could imagine, will just calculate average of that, and then the grade will depend on that. For grad student, I want not only depends on the average of test score, but also research credit. Let's look at our grass student. The minute I the minute I have this, that is inheritance. Okay? Class name, grass student, inherit publicly from student. Everything else the same? Now you see, okay, why is this so short? You said you're gonna do so many things. Everything in here is because I'm adding on top or I'm overwriting. Because the minute I have column public students, everything I have here, exact constructor, will be copied over in here, even though you can see it. So now if I show you that, what do we have for grad student? Variables, member variables, what do we have for grad student? We have name, we have test one, test two, test three, and research, correct. We have everything we have over here, the member, right, member variables, and also here. How about functions? We have an average function. We have a grade function that is the same as the grade function that you inherited over. This means that we are overriding. Okay, and then its own constructor because constructor uh, does do not constructors in general just do not get inherited. So write your own constructor. If you put overwrite, overwrite. 
if you're going to add, add. Everything else, from here. Sorry. Yeah. Are we saying that the private class members are going to be also inherited? That's right. So you owe all the members, including public, private, protected. If you look at this carefully, we're actually going to, but since you have noticed, this is saying that well, Y has S substitute. That's what makes it tricky because do I own them? You do, right? As a grad student, you have test one, test two, test three. Can you access the mean? Can you change it? Can you read it? Can you do anything about it? You cannot. All right, you cannot directly do it. So we'll show an example of how. To do that. But that's the difference between: Do I have a copy of it? Yes. Can I directly write to it? You cannot. That's what access means. Yes. And why there are both when that one is in? What? Like down there is float oh, yeah. only. Down here is float, is it float? Yeah. Origin. Up there is like the original one is like int test one, int test two, int. Int, yes. Down there is like float for the double bread. She's talking about yes. the construct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, the grad student. Oh, because I had a typo. Great catch. They should say. But you will see very soon why. Oh. But yes, they should be it. Yeah, there we go. Did I fix it? No? Yeah, yeah I fixed it. I fixed it. See? <laughs> I fixed it. I just forgot a slide. But let me mark it so that I remember to fix that. This slide, this slide. So I fixed this one, but I missed this one. Yeah. Okay. Slide 17. Okay. Good catch. And it should be it. Uh, question, yes. Don't we get the difference between owning and, uh, and uh, accessing? You say that you cannot change the variables, right? That's right. But then you cannot directly change it. But what do you mean by changing it? Right? So you'll see. You'll see. Oh. I'll show you how can we change it. All right. So before that, let's look at our variables. On the top is grad student, which inherit from public student, public inherit from student, and then down here is my base class student. Right, so I fix the parameter. Those are all ints, so it should be string, int, 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 another int, right? Because we have more than three, we have four now. And then we're overriding string. Great, that's our setup. Yeah? This is our implementation of grad student. Let's look at it. by 
I say putting anything that's equal or reading or writing, you just cannot touch it. It's private to student. It's owned by student, controlled by student, it's private to student. If you want to change it, you do it through student. That's what the student constructor is for, right? Student constructor is native to student and is taking parameters and changing private members. Because grad student does not have access to any of the private member of student, but we still have those variables, right? You still have test one, test two, test three, and research, which is new for this class. I have a copy of them for grad student. So grad student has four, four test scores. The only way for you to modify them is by calling constructor of class student. And this is how you call a constructor of student. You write your constructor the way you would like. You put one single column, put in your base class name, and you trigger the constructor. See, this is different than that. That is, you are defining a constructor. This is, I am calling a constructor. That is why the parameter has the same name. Because what you're doing is you're calling a function, pass in local variable you have within grad student. In addition, you do have access to your own research credit. Therefore, you just regularly, like you will do, you take the research parameter, you just assign to it, that will work. All right? So that's constructor of base class, how you interact with constructor of base class from the derived class, and why do you do it? Question? Absolutely, because the minute that you get to get past 77, you're in definition mode. In definition, you can call function. You can call it however you want, right? Say that this parameter is somewhere in here. So you have T1, T2, research, T3. You still call T1, T2, T3 here, right? Say you completely swap the other, and your T1 means T3 for that. I mean, you can make it really confusing. You can have T3, T2, T1 here as well. Those are just local variable names. You just need to make sure what you are passing into the constructor match what you what the original constructor would do. Because that is what you're essentially running. Okay. So they do not need to match. The all doesn't need to match. You can name them however you want. They don't need to match that. You can, yeah, you can do whatever. It's a function call. It's a special function call of a base class construct. Yeah. And this slide when it says like the class Y inherits from the class X, mm -hmm. and it says the class Y automatically has access to the member variables and member function. Mm -hmm. That has access to the copy of the members, but not the like members means like for example, does it have access to the private or not? Class Y. It owns. A, it owns. Right. It has a copy of everything, right? Even members, the private? Even the private, right? Test one, test two, are two and three are private. It definitely get a copy of everything. Public, private, protected, everything. Gets a copy of it. Therefore, grad student will have test one, test two, test three, even though that those are all private. Then question, uh, if we don't um, trigger the constructor. constructor, how we can have access to that copy? You do not. Unless, in your base graph, you have another function in base class. In base class, you have another function that change test one, test two, test three. You could do that. But everything has to go through base class. Base class is the only class that has access to private. Even though that grad student has a copy of everything, it does not mean that you can change them however you want, because those are still privately owned by your base class. 
yeah, it's kind of like, you know, why do you do that? This is the privacy issue, right? This is where we're trying to make hacking as hard as possible, but sometimes it also means making our life a little harder. You're like, oh, that's so, so weird. But when you are have what we call a private of a class, this is guaranteed the property of a private where you and yourself are the only people can access private unless you give out the private to other. To make sure that the statement is always true, that's why we have this. Right? Even when you derive, when you inherit, we still want to make sure that safety is true. Because this could be implemented by me, that could be implemented by you. You don't you would not know how other people are gonna use your class. You, if you're gonna protect using private, C plus want to guarantee that those are protected. So that is why, even though this, right, you own a copy, yes, that's the nature of deriving or inheritance. But you cannot break the rule of this is private to student. It is only accessible for student. That is why it's yeah, it's like that. Just reconfirming, basically, we cannot construct new constructor, right? But we cannot just overwrite a constructor. Oh, yeah. You cannot overwrite your base class constructor. You can only make your new constructor. So we have only choice between calling it explicitly and implicitly. That's it. Yes, I'll talk about implicitly in the next step. Okay. But this is explicitly, right? Because there are parameters that I need to pass in. Like you were saying, it could be any other. Whoever write this class need to determine which to pass in where. So you have to kind of write it out. Like, okay, what's the first parameter you want to pass in? Okay, n. And then t1, d2, d3. And yes, they can be completely different names. They're all local to that constructor. You can name them however you want. Right? Now, before we go another example, so let's just focus on this example because there are two. Uh, another thing that's happening is overriding function, right? What does that mean? In your grad student, where did my, where's my student? Not include this. Okay, let's go back here. In your grad student, we have this, which is I am defining the same function, same return text, same name, same parameter. As what I already have inherited, I uh, have already inherited from the base class here. So base class has its own string grid. Same signature, same return type, exactly the same as what grad student, oh, up here, right? As what grad student would like to write. Now, why do we do that? Why would grass do that want to do something exactly the same way? It's not exactly the same. That is why. For a student, remember your grade will be calculated based on your average of three test scores. However, for grad student, we talked about we want it to be determined by also the research grade. So the calculation of grade are different between your base class and your inherited class. But it also share a portion. For grad student grade, we not only want to look at research, we still look at test one, test two, test three, and then look at them the same way as a student would, where your average grade of seven is going to be pass and otherwise no pass for the test one, test two, and test three. Here, I'm just adding another layer you can think of that you not only need to pass those three. You also need to pass research credit. Um, so I said to step, but this could be whatever, okay? For to return the proper grade for grad student. Why don't we just define another function? We don't want inheritance to limit how you define your function inside grad student. Therefore, overriding is possible. If you, if this is the way you think you should calculate grade, then you should be able to override what you inherited over and enhance it, customize it, change it to the way you want. So yes, overriding is possible, and most commonly, 
in a function overriding is that we will trigger the base pass function first. So you can see that here, the first thing that I do in grad student grade is to call student grade. Right? Super common, this is again, we do not want to re-implement that. We just trigger it, that tell me whether it passed the tests. In addition, I then look at whether it passed research credit as well. Other than not having a duplicated code, another reason that we are so eager to call the base class function is that most likely we do not have access to average. Most likely that's private. I think we did have it as private. I don't remember, but if this is private, you can't even copy it over. It's not, it's not bad. So the best or the optimal way of you interacting with base class is through base class. Instead of trying to go in and modify the things that you want. Safest way, it always works. If you try to directly access, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't depend on whether it's protected or not. Yeah. Um, back to the uh, inheritance and not um, inheriting private uh, Members, members mm -hmm. and still having access to the, the class members but not being able to be using them. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at this example and I see that actually, so I had a question but I didn't ask because I was kind of dubious now. So if you're actually able to inherit from a class that actually has private functions mm -hmm. and you're passing it to the inherited class, mm -hmm. passing those private members, mm -hmm. so up to that point we are passing memory blocks that actually are reserving uh, for the type that they're passing. Not memory, just code base. That's all. So you can see, you see the, the reason I have the arrows is that it, when you debug, you will see that the control switch, remember when we talked about overhead, yeah. So the minute that you got to here, it will jump. Your debugger will jump to another file, another function, and then it will be there and wait for instruction again. Do you want me to run this or not, you know? Mm. So it will have the control switch, yes. Other than that, no, it has no other So it won't, it it won't dedicate any memory blocks to it? No, because the student, test one, test two, test three, they belong to grad student, right? Meaning that the minute you create grad student, you need to have memory for test one, test two, test three, and research credit. So the memory was not allocated the minute that you created a class, just as any other class. That's why we have. I say that you have a copy. You need room for that copy. Yes. But do I need room for calling that function? You don't, right? You just go to that code and you call that function and you run it. Um, so no, you do not reserve space for base class memory. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what is research credit then? If we can't get it, what is research credit in the grad student? Research credit is a private member of grad student and grad student. So we basically calculate average again, or? You basically say that you have to pass tests and you also have to pass research. You don't, oh, but it's, you don't, it's calculate, another... you don't calculate average. Because you were saying that we can't, we can't access average, right, sometimes. Yeah. Like and, that. Uh, so this is not average, this is one single. This is, you have one score for that. That's an average, right? Oh, okay. That's an average of test one, test two, and test three. This is just like a number, like 86. I understand, yeah. yeah. So both need to be greater than 70 to pass, and that's how I implement it. I just thought that you replaced the average with research credit, and this is why I got it. Oh, no. no, no. Is there a just one number? Average is what you calculate that from. Alright, remember we talked about what other things I had it? I know this is a big a lot of code, but all that I'm saying is that when you have uh, overloading of pre and post increment, it will be in our as well. 
we use actually pretty nice. Remember when we just do them pre and post increment, it will do like test one, test two, test three, add one, right? If you have that inherited, then you can either keep it if you don't want to add research partners or you don't even need to do anything. So your grad student plus plus will just add a one for all the test score and leave the research score the same, which is reasonable. So it, there is a way that you don't even need to touch it. If you want to overload that in the way that you could do it as well. So there's some flexibility when you are overloading operator for the base class, those get inherited over as long as they are not assigned, right? As long as they are not assigned. All right, now let's look at, let's main. In my main, I have two objects, student as, one, as zero and grad student as one. Student as zero, constructor taking me, test one, test two, test three, right? Pretty familiar. Grad student as one, taking me, test one, test two, test three, research. Okay. Now let's look at our function call. When I call s one dot get average, that will call which function? Exactly, because we do not have a get average for grad student, but it was inherited from student. So what we're calling is that. That's right. Let's look at the next line. When I'm calling s one dot grade, when am I calling? I'm sorry. It's, it's yeah, right. Right. You are calling the new version of grade because you overwrite it in grad student. So once it goes to that, then it goes to the other one, and then... Exactly. Because you triggered student grade, then the first thing that it will do at line 85 is, that's right, go back to the base class grade, run that, come back to here. That's right. Perfect. Move on. Now let's look at the next example. This one we focus on default constructor and protective members. Remember default constructor? Every single class has a default constructor. Default constructor is a constructor that takes no parameters, right? By default, the default constructor do nothing, right? The constructor is there so that your compiler know to allocate enough memories for your variable. That's all that's but remember how we use constructor is we actually initialize it with things, right? You can actually over, I will not call override, you can actually define your default constructor the way you want. For this one, I'm a student class and I am defining my own default constructor because it takes in no parameter and anything that takes in no parameter is the default. So I have that, I need to be like, okay, I know you're gonna do your thing, you do your thing, you allocate your memory, but in addition, I want you to print that my constructor is being triggered. Completely fine, you can write your own default constructor. In addition to that, in this example, I am also specifically having all my variables protected. A pretty example has everything private. That's where, where we focus on and talk about how you work with the private from being class. But the minute you set it in protective mode, it's fully open to derived classes. And they are only open to derived classes, which is very nice. That is the middle layer between all public, whoever can call it changes, and do whatever. Or uh, private, no one can change it, no one can use it. Where the middle layer protected is that no one else other than my derived classes can access to it. So a lot of the time when you have derived, people tend to have protected. So even base class can uh, base class cannot access? Say that again, even base So class? so you said only only uh, only uh, derived uh, classes can access protected. Yeah. Nothing else. Yet. What about base? I mean, I know it's already in a base class, but like. Oh, you mean in student class? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It also yeah. Students. Students can do whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Students can do whatever. But oh, when I say that only derive is that any other yeah. classes you cannot. Yeah. yeah. 
that's what we talked about. You have a visual. Perfect. That's right. All right. Default constructor. Default constructor will be implicitly triggered at the beginning of press. So one, you do not got to control when to trigger it. Two, it will be triggered. It has to be triggered. You can't even cancel it. Okay. Let's look at grass student. In grass student constructor, it looks just like any other constructor you have. Where I take it and you want to do weird research, right? Because those are protected now, I can directly do that, right? However, in between or at the beginning of 36, your base class constructor will be triggered, has to be triggered in that specific, at that specific line. So before any of this run, we will see in our printout that your base class constructor will be triggered first. So if you have anything that happened in there, you don't have a control whether it happened, it will happen for sure. It will happen. So that is default constructor. Question? Alright. Yes, we talked about this. When it's protected now, we can directly access them. We can change however we want. So you can see this is a way straightforward way. However, it's not as safe. Imagine that it's username and password and balance. If you put it in protected, whoever you have that class can just change it. Okay? So sometimes you do want them to be private and you do want whatever other class Go through your own function to change your private thing. And sometimes if you think it's okay and you know who are deriving from you, then you can open it up to protect it without risking any other classes like this. Alright, here's our full example. So let's focus on me. So in main, I'm going to have a, an object, grass student, name as one, with name test one, test two, test three, research, right? The minute that happens, we're going to go to grass student constructor over here. Before any of this happens, it will run student's constructor call. And then grass students constructor called because I print it out so that you know the order. And then finally you run the recipe. Any question on default constructor and protective measures? Alright. Destructor. Talk about constructor, let's talk about destructor. Remember destructor, the way that it runs is always in the reverse order to make sure we do not have dependency that got cut. Right, we talked about that. Same thing for derived classes. Where say that I have my constructor and destructor for student, right? Both uh, the default. I also have a default grass student constructor and grass student destructor. For every single function, I am only printing it out so that we can see the order of it being triggered automatically. So let's look at our main. I'm oh, sorry. Let's look at the run order. The first time you trigger grass student, it will trigger student first. Right? So this should go out first. And then I'm going to come back and run the rest of your constructor, which will be that. Right? Now, when you're done, the first thing that got destroyed should be whatever that's created later, which will be grass student. So that will run first. Everything is our destructure will trigger be triggered first, and then finally, student destructor. Question on that? So here's if you don't believe me, here's how I prove that. You run it, and you can see the other student constructor being triggered, grass student constructor being triggered, and then grass student being destroyed, and then student, right, in reverse order. Alright, we've been 
been talking about single inheritance, it is possible to have multiple inheritance, where I don't just want to design my new class based on this one single base class, I want it to be derived from multiple base classes. Is that possible? Absolutely. I want to have a class called student account. I have a base class student, I have a base class account. I want to merge them. Completely fine. Syntax is also pretty straightforward. So before we go to the syntax, setting the stage. Very simple setup for student, default constructor, name test, one name, one test. That's my constructor. I have initial value. It's going to let us know that it's been triggered. Account, same thing, default constructor, username and password, right? It's kind of not safe, but for demo purposes. Print out the constructor, have a default username and password, that's the setup, right? Two base classes, student and account. Let's look at our inheritance. Your new class student inherit from student comma account. Question that you ask right now is does the other matter? It does matter because remember for default constructor, they are triggered automatically in the order you derive. In the order you do that. So if I zoom in over here, my first class that's being derived from is student. The second one is a cat, right? Therefore, when I am inside my student account constructor, if I have two default constructors, it will run student first. And then it will run a cat. And finally, it will run the rest of your student account constructor. Right? So here's how I prove it. If you look at the print statement, student constructor call, account constructor call, student accounts constructor call, you will see if I print those out, right? The minute I did was print, which print will just print everything that as they are, right? It will print all the default value that I set from here and here to prove to you that it actually run it. And then the minute that I finish running 52 to 55, I have them nicely formatted. Okay? So the order of how you inherit multiple class does matter because the constructor are triggered in that same order. All right, different types of inheritance. We talked about public inheritance, and I have only shown you public inheritance. That's all we're going to use for this class. There are other ways to inherit. There are public inheritance and private inheritance. The difference between all of them is whether you change what you got, what you inherit over. For public, you do not. If it's public inheritance, when it's public from base, it's public in the right. When it's protected in base, it stays protected in the right. When it's private, you cannot touch it because it's private. Now, if I go to protected inheritance, the public from base class become protected. Protected, stay protected. Private, inaccessible. Now, the strict one is private, where if you have private inheritance, public become private, protected become private, private directly unaccessible. Why do you have three different levels of inheritance? Because base class A, Derive class B from A, you can have C derived from B, you can have D derived from C, you can go the train all the way straight up to Z if you want. If we don't have constraint on the inheritance, if you always use public, A is exposing a lot to Z, which is way down, right? A lot of time when we want to prevent that from happening, you could go very strict, meaning that I only allow you to inherit me once. If you do it again, nothing at your side that you can inherit from me can
can be accessible from the third one. So everything stay controlled within the class where the functions are defined because they're all private. If you don't want that, you just want to make sure that the things that you have are only accessible from A to B, not A, A, B, B, C, C, E, D, then yes, you can use the protected one. For our case, we will only do one level of inheritance for this class, so public is fine. All right, summary. Inheritance is when you create a class that you use the base class concept, so you don't need to over du write duplicated code and it indicate an is a relationship only. Contractor, destructor, and assignment operator do not get inherited, but you can call them, you can access them. Constructor and destructor of base and derived class. Uh, we also show you default, right? And then we show you how protected class member works. Simple example of the model inheritance. And finally, just explain to you the difference between public protected and private. We will only be using public inheritance. Now, this I will review next week. Everything that I teach you next week depends on this. Okay, same thing as inheritance it depends on overriding. But you can see the link was not that strong for inheritance. If you say, I'm still a little confused about inheritance, sorry, overloading, you can survive today, right? It's fine. I mean, I did mention plus plus, I did review it. <coughs> but inheritance, directly going to the next one, polymorphism. We need inheritance as the base graph. Everything that I talk about next week is based on the assumption that you're all good with inheritance. So please spend some time this week to make sure you really understand this because otherwise next class, when it be like any question, everyone will look at me so confused, right? That is only because I built on top of this directly. So those two weeks link very closely together. With that, that's all for today.